Hello and uh, welcome to this screencast about evolution and the mutation spectrum. I'm going to be talking in the next uh, talk about the role of mutation as a dispositional factor in evolution. But before getting to that, in this short talk I'm going to give some background um, about concepts that are important for understanding this role. So first of all, what's mutation? Um, it's a heritable change to the genetic material. Uh, it involves a material change, not just a replacement. So selection and drift act by logical replacement, whereas mutation is a material transformation, and it's bounded in a lineage. So here in this figure, we're tracing the lineage of a, of a particular sequence through some individuals, and at a particular point in time, there's a change from T to G. That's a mutational change. Now, this term mutation is overloaded. It has many different meanings in science, in the scientific writing, even in the technical writing, even in evolution. So for instance, in population genetics, we often see the term fixed mutation. Fixation means approaching a frequency of one. But what's the thing that goes to fixation? It's not a mutational event. It's not the process of mutation. It's the outcome of a mutational event, the mutant allele. And, and it, the word mutation is often used that way to, to refer to the product or the type of product, the type of allele that's produced by a mutation. But we want to be clear about causes and about mutation as a cause. And in order to do that, we need to make a strong distinction between the process of mutation that happens in individuals and other things that happen downstream from that. Um, so one of the basic questions to ask about mutation is what are the possibilities? Uh, what's the universe of mutation? Well, it turns out that it's much, much bigger and more complex than just the set of point mutations that, that one often thinks about first. So base substitutions and single nucleotide insertions and deletions, that's what we mean by point mutations. Um, if you start counting the numbers of possible deletions or tandem duplications or inversions, each of those is much, much larger than the number of point mutations. Um, and it, there are even more complicated types of mutations that are more numerous than that. So insertions or transpositions and lateral transfers and compound uh, types of mutations, those numbers become just astronomical, the number of, of possible mutations. And of course, as I'll explain in, in a moment, most of these mutations take place at individually very low rates. What is a mutation rate? So it quantifies the time dependent occurrence of mutational changes. It's specified by a non-empty from state, maybe just one genotype or a set of them, and some two states. It has clock time or generations in the denominator. It's often represented with the, in mathematical equations with the Greek letter uh, mu or with u or m or big U for the whole genome mutation rate. Mutation rates have an enormous range. So starting in the middle of this figure here, an ordinary nucleotide substitution in humans uh, takes place at a rate of 10 to the minus eighth per site uh, per generation, uh, but a transition at a CPG site would be about tenfold higher than that. The chance of duplication of a locus would be another order of magnitude higher than that. And there are uh, short tan and repeat mutations that, ch that add or subtract a copy that take place at even higher rates, often in the range of 10 to the minus 3 per generation. So those are the high rates, but then there are also lower rates. So here's a bunch of rates from, for more and more complex uh, insertions or deletions. So these are called micro-indels, short insertions less than, let's say, 50 base pairs. And they tend to follow a, a power law, so it's easy to estimate what the, uh, what the rates are for different classes of these things. And for any kind of low rate like this, you can think of an even lower, even more complicated mutation that would happen at a lower rate. So how diverse are these mutation rates? The importance of asking this question is that if we're, if we're interested in exploring the effects of mutation and evolution, mutation as a dispositional factor, okay, that the premises of that are that there are differences in mutation rates and they have an impact. So in the next section, in the next talk, I'm going to be going over the theory of how uh, biases in mutation or tendencies of variation can have an impact theoretically on evolution. And but, but before getting to that in, in this introductory talk, I want to just briefly uh, give an overview of the, of the components of diversity and rates. So, for instance, um, 
by type of mutation, as we've already seen, there are many orders of magnitude of diversity in rates of mutation if we compare nucleotide substitutions to deletions or insertions or something like that. There are also big differences by, by sequence context. If we look at taxonomic diversity, comparing one species to another, there are many orders of magnitude of difference in the genomic mutation rate, um, either per genome or if you're looking at rate of mutations per site. If we look at specific kinds of mutation biases, and this information is only becoming available now in the last 10 years or so, where we can look at the mutation spectrum in detail in different species for mutation accumulation experiments. So transition transversion bias has about a 20-fold range in different species, and similarly for GCAT bias. Um, the ratio of single nucleotide mutations to tandem double nucleotide mutations um, at, at the high end in um, somatic hypermutation of antibodies, the double nucleotide mutation rate is about 5% of the single nucleotide mutation rate. But in other species where it's been examined, and there's a you know 10 or 20 by now, it's maybe an order mag of magnitude or two orders of magnitude lower than that. Um, there are also differences by cell type or by tissue type. Probably many of you have heard about um, male mutation bias, for instance. That's male germline versus, uh, versus female germline. Um, here is a fascinating study from Krasovec and colleagues about uh, growth conditions. So on the y-axis over here, we have a million-fold difference in mutation rates as a function of population density. So this is a meta-analysis of growth experiments where uh, experiments were measure, where mutation rates were measured at different growth rates. So for instance, here's a bunch of uh, brown diamonds that represent bacteriophage VX174, and here's some purple triangles down here that represent Salmonella enterica, showing for that species an order of magnitude range of the mutation rate as a function of population density. And if you want to know more about that and the reasons for that, see this paper by Krasovec. So here's another example. This is from Maharjan and, and Ferenczi, uh, who, who grew E. coli under different conditions, so iron limitation, oxygen limitation, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon limitation. And under these different conditions, they saw a different total mutation rate and also a different spectrum of mutation rate when it's divided between base pair substitutions, single single site indels, larger ones, and uh, insertion sequences, transposition of insertion sequences. And you can see here, for instance, something I, I didn't mention previously is that although many times when, sci when scientists model mutation, they only include base substitutions, actually the base substitutions are in most of these conditions not the majority of the mutations that happen. Okay, what's a mutation spectrum? A mutation spectrum is any way of breaking down a mutation rate into components. So for instance, we could have reversible rates for six different types of nucleotide mutations, which is what we see here. Or in the cancer research literature, one often sees these mutational signatures, which, which are context-dependent rates. So you take an upstream nucleotide and a downstream nucleotide of context. There's four times four, so 16 different contexts for each of the six nucleotide uh, mutations. So that gives a total of 96 different bars here, and you can see they take place at widely differing rates. So these are both different kinds of mutation spectra. Um, two things that are not strictly mutation spectra, the M matrix isn't a way of breaking down the mutation rate into parts that add up to one. Um, it's a projection or a transformation of the total effect of mutation onto a space of trait variability. Um, one also sees a kind of informal reasoning that says that there, out of all the things that are th hypothetically possible, there are some that are actually accessible by mutation and others that are not accessible by, by mutation. And without going into too much detail about that, um, I just want to discourage that kind of thinking because, as I, as I said earlier, there is a whole range of mutation rates. Um, going up to 10 to the minus 3, and there's some kinds of programmed DNA uh, mutations that take place at even higher rates than that, and, and there's no lower limit here. So there isn't any natural condition where you could just say, given this population size and given that I'm only looking at, you know, 100 generations or something, I can ignore all, all mutations down here, or I can, there's no condition where you can just assume that there are only base substitutions or something like that. That's not... So, you know, simplica simplifications are often useful in science, but it is not, in fact, realistic to talk uh, 
this way about mutation. All right, what's a mutation bias? A mutation bias is any systematic difference in rates for two types of mutations. So, for instance, if we start out with a mutation spectrum that looks like this, we could make some different mutation bias claims. We could say mutation is biased toward transitions. If we, if we add up the two red bars and compare them to the four green bars, okay, that's an aggregate uh, rate ratio of about 1.5 here. And if we look at the average height of red bars versus the average height of green bars, that's about a threefold effect. That's often symbolized by kappa uh, in the molecular evolution literature. And also, we could talk about AT bias. So if you look at the columns that go to AT, this one, this one, and this one, they are, in aggregate, higher than the, the other three. All right, And so we would say, on that basis, mutation is biased toward AT. Does the bias in the word mutation bias mean that there's a bias in fitness? No, that doesn't. that's not related. That's a different thing, and we have different words for that. The words that we have for talking about the is the distribution of fitness effects, or DFE. Or sometimes, if you're only talking about beneficial ones, it's the DBFE. So here's a couple of hypothetical examples over here on the right, and it's showing a distribution with two, with two modes. There's a mode near zero, this is, this is the benign or neut neutral mode over here, and, uh, and then there's a mode down here at, at minus one for, for things that are lethal, all right? And the difference between these two um, hypothetical distributions here is that the, the benign mode in the top one is dominated by neutral mutations, and the more benign mode down here is dominated by slightly deleterious or, or, or more deleterious um, mutations. And actual empirical um, DFEs, this one is from a phage, sometimes have this distinctly bimodal distribution. All right, and for aficionados, this DFE comes in different forms. I won't say much about this uh, for now. Okay, finally, what about phenotypes and the idea of a phenotypic bias? What if we observe, um, starting with some stock of organism, uh, we, we measure the mutation rate to, to one kind of phenotype and to another kind of phenotype, and we find that those are different. Um, how do such preferences reflect aspects of mutation and development? Well, we usually think about that in terms of a genotype-phenotype map. So if consider this abstract map on the left. Um, genotypes are nodes in this little network. Going from one node to another indicates um, an incremental change, like a single nucleotide change or an allelic substitution or something like that. And when you make that incremental change in genotype space, then that will either change or not change the phenotype here, which will either change or not change the effect on fitness. Now, this concept of a genotype phenotype map is often used very abstractly, but there's some cases where we can flesh it out very systematically, and one of those is in the case of RNA folds. So here's a case showing just three folds. So it's possible to generate lots and lots of RNA sequences and fold them up into a computer and to what's believed to be their, their native state. And um, this is just showing the net genotypic network for three different folds, the blue one, the gray one, and the red one. And what this diagram is showing is that starting, on average, if you average over all the possibilities here, starting in a blue fold, um, the gray fold is more mutationally accessible than the red one. So to think about this a little bit more, because it's important to have a really solid understanding of this concept, let's go down to the simplest genotype-phenotype map that we have, the genetic code, all right, where we have triplet genotypes like TAT that map to amino acid phenotypes. And what I want to talk about are some pathways from the methionine phenotype encoded by ATG to some alternative possibilities here. So if we consider methionine going to valine or lysine, we expect a bias toward the valine phenotype, okay? Because this mutation is a transition, but this mutation, so A to G at the first position, uh, but this, this mutation, T to A, at the second position is a transversion, and transitions tend to take place at a higher rate than transversions. So that's a kind of path-specific mutation bias. But we could also get something else. We, we also expect the methionine to leucine to be favored, but for a completely different reason. There's two different leucine codons that are accessible by changing a single nucleotide on this methionine codon. All right? And so 
even if there are no differences in the mutation rates here, we would have two transversions versus one transversion. So we expect a bias um, toward leucine, not because of any path specific rate, because, but because of the path density or the aggregate number of paths. And of course, if you can have this fact, effect and you can have this effect, then you can have both effects at the same time. So uh, methionine going to valine or leucine, we've got one transition going here or two possible transversions down here. And if the, tra if the rate specific uh, transition rate is, is, uh, is like three or four fold higher than the rate of transversion, then the overall bias would be toward the valine phenotype here. Okay, and so out of all those nine, uh, there's, there's nine single nucleotide paths from the methionine codon to, to other codons, and those render accessible um, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven different amino acids. I'm sorry, six different amino acids. Leucine, isoleucine, valine, plus threonine, lysine, and arginine. Uh, but I mentioned previously that double base substitutions are real and they happen in evolution and the rate is not uh, inconsiderable. So in humans, the rate of tandem double nucleotide mutations is about 0.4% of the single nucleotide rate. So what if we take those into account? Well, um, for one thing, anything that begins, any codon that begins with A, we can just change the last two nucleotides. So now we can access um, not just threonine, but asparagine and serine as well. Or any codon that ends in G, so these end in G, these end in G, these end in G down here. So that means um, we can add serine, we can add proline, glutamine, and arginine. We can add uh, alanine, glutamine, I'm sorry, glutamate, and glycine to that list. And so now there's just a few that, there's just a few that aren't accessible by a single or a double nucleotide mutation. So um, we have aspartate down here, we have tyrosine, cysteine, and then phenylalanine. Actually, if you have um, two mutations, but they're not uh, next to each other at the first and third position, then you can get to phenylalanine. But triple nucleotide mutations also happen. So if we added those, we would also have pathways to tyrosine, to cysteine, and to aspartate down here. So, so really, if we're going to be um, serious about this, there is a rate of mutation from methionine to every other codon and every other amino acid. All right, the rates might be three or four orders of magnitude lower than the rate to the most likely uh, alternative, which is isoleucine. But it's still a, a, it's still something that's within the realm of possibility under most conditions. And in fact, I, I think this is the way to think about phenotypic bias or any kind of bias. It's always the same thing. There are mutation rates that are defined by a set of from states and to states. A mutation bias is an inequality of rates. And so a phenotypic accessibility bias is a kind of mutation bias. You're always summing. Oh, if you ever see that kind of bias, it's all, it always reflects two factors, the number of different mutational pathways and their rates all summed together. So you could be talking about the RNA fold case that I showed you before. You could talk, be talking about the work of Peter Lind on the wrinkly spreader phenotype where there are different ways of being wrinkly spreader that have different degrees of mutational accessibility. Or you could be talking about this experimental study with C. elegans where uh, the, the authors um, report on different uh, kinds of, of, of alternative phenotypes that have different mutational accessibility. It's always the same thing. Um, again, mutational accessibility of alternative phenotypes is something that's real valued and positive. It's always a sum of rates over the possible mutational routes. It's not a logical binary, um, and it's not limited to phenotypes accessible by single nucleotide mutations. There, as I mentioned previously, there's 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 no condition where you there's no kind of natural condition where you could say only single nucleotide mutations will occur, and and not in, and I can ignore everything else. Okay, now that's local bias. There's also a kind of global bias that one see, sees in some parts of the literature. So in, the, in some of the genotype phenotype map literature, this is called phenotype bias. Um, and, and that's really referring to something a little bit different, not the bias from one particular point, but a global bias. If you were starting, if you were averaging over evolution starting from all possible points, or if you were averaging over the long-term 
uh, evolutionary traverse, like an infinite traverse of evolution, then it would matter that leucine and serine and arginine, for instance, each have six codons, but methionine and tryptophan only have one. Okay, so in that long-term traverse of evolution, or in evolution starting from many different places, you would expect to see more leucine and serine and arginine and less tryptophan and methionine. And in fact, that's what we see in evolution. It's a well-known observation in molecular evolution that we see this correlation between amino acid frequency and proteins and this, the number of codons in the genetic code. Okay, so to summarize um, what I've said so far, um, the range of mutation rates is enormous. There's no lower limit. Uh, the universe of mutations is mostly dark matter, and I just mean there are uh, more complex mutations than point mutations, but they occur at individually very low rates. Um, these path-specific rates reflect a number of factors, the, the, the topology of the mutation, the size of the mutation, the context, the cell type, the environment. Just about anything that you can think of in biology is going to have some kind of effect, and sometimes they're quite large. Um, a mutation spectrum is something that breaks down the mutation rate into parts. A mutation bias is an inequality between those parts. Local biases in phenotype accessibility reflect rate sum over path, and that way of conceptualizing bias applies to many, many different things. Okay, so thanks for listening. In the next talk, um, I'll be talking about how mutation can influence evolution in a dispositional way. We'll be looking at different kinds of theory from population genetics um, and asking if you take a mutation rate, a, 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 a whole genome mutation rate or a uniform mutation rate, and you replace that with a mutation spectrum so that there's heterogeneity, what kind of interesting behavior do you get? So thanks again for listening. Um, here are some of the references that I, that I cited, and I hope to see you at the next talk.